Hey guys, Solomon here. I hope you're having a great day. In today's video, we're going to be covering how to play the hippopotamus defense. And, and for those of you that, that have never heard of the hippo, what the heck is the hippo defense, right? I, I see people playing it sometimes. I've heard of it. This guy on YouTube has made way too many videos on it. What the heck is the hippo? We're going to be answering that question in today's video. But before that, for those of you that have been following this channel, that have been playing and following the hippo content, today's a special day. Okay, and the reason for that is because it's February 15th. Why on earth does February 15th matter on a channel like this that covers chess opening theory and such? Well, because it's World Hippo Day. And because of that, I'm going to be giving out a 30% discount code to my Hippopotamus Defense course over six hours in content. A lot of you guys have told me that you've gained and benefited from this course and enjoyed it. And uh, for those of you that, that have invested or are going to invest, I appreciate you guys a ton. Okay. And for those of you that haven't invested and have been following the content, I appreciate y'all a ton as well. And, um, yeah, I'm just humbled that you're here in the first place. Okay. All you got to do to get that 30% off is go down. Okay. To the link. I'm going to leave the link in the pinned comment and in the description below, and then go to the link, go to the course and plug in the discount code world hippo day. And you're going to get 30% off only good, um, until the end of the 20th. Okay. So only good for about five days. Uh, if you're interested, I highly recommend you go over there, check it out, plug in that discount code and you're going to get 30% off. Now let's, let's, let's just start out with the question though. For those of you that don't know what the heck the hippo is, right? Maybe this is your first time. What is it? Well, let's look at the following position. This is the setup that we're trying to get. We're trying to fee and keto both of our bishops. We're tucking our knights on e7 and d7, and we're putting six pawns on the sixth rank. Now, there's going to be exceptions to this, rare exceptions, but most of the time you're going to get this exact setup. Two knights tucked, two bishops being kettoed, and six pawns on the sixth rank. You can play this as white as well. I played the hippo exclusively as white and black. Um, and, uh, and it helped me reach both this, the candidate master CM and national master titles NM. Okay. So, you know, I'm a big believer in the hippo. Um, I'm not trying to sell something that I don't believe in. I think this is a very strong opening and, um, and I've seen grandmaster players, including Magnus Carlson lose to it. Okay. So I think it's very strong. Now we're going to cover this position and just kind of the basic framework. Why would someone play the hippo? All that kind of good stuff. But first off, how do we get here? Okay. Now, in my first ever video on the hippopotamus defense, I said that move order doesn't matter a ton or something along those lines. I take that back. Okay, I do. Um, you know, I, I do think that move order matters quite a bit, but there's so many different move orders that work. And a lot of the time, not always, but a lot of the time, the move order doesn't actually affect things. If you, depending on your level and depending on how the opponent responds. Now, I do think there's certain move orders that are beneficial depending on what your opponent plays. Um, but I've seen a lot of you guys even start out the game with like E6 and D6. Okay. You guys have told me that you, that you do this. I think there's some issues with that, but if it works for you, it works for you. Okay. At the end of the day, at the end of the day, chess openings, it's not about playing what some YouTuber tells you. It's not about, oh, Magnus Carlsen doesn't play it ever. It's never seen in the world championship, which, which by the way, the, the hippopotamus defense has been seen in a world championship twice with Petrosian and Spassky, which a lot of openings can't, you know, really, you know say about themselves, but whatever you get the point. Um, it's all about what you like. If you like an opening, you're going to play better with it than the, the better opening that you don't like. Okay. That's my, that's my theory. That's, that's my approach to openings. Now, what, what do I recommend? I play the modern defense, right? I play the modern defense, but there's a lot of different move orders again, that you can get into that structure with at the end of the day, you're just trying to get a setup. You don't care what the opponent plays. You're trying to feed and kettle your Bishop, tuck your Knights and get those six pawns in the sixth rank. Right now I play the modern defense, but there I've seen international master grandmaster players, you know, play moves like the French defense, the Peart's defense, the Owens defense. There's so many different options here and, um, you know, the, I've, I've seen them all work. Okay. So all that to say, let's say white plays a move like E4. Okay. All right. We play G6 with the modern defense. Okay. Now this is how I start out games. I go one, two, three. Okay. One, two, three. And then from there, I'll often play E6. So one, two, three, four, five. Okay. And then from here, you know, there's there's a lot of different things that you can do. Let's say we play B6 to try to fianchetto the second bishop and white plays queen D2. We don't want to let bishop H6 happen. Okay. Now, when I, when I was first studying the hippo, right, I, I saw that the engine actually didn't mind white playing this. This is a big mistake, guys. Okay. Especially in the opening. Don't worry so much about what the computer's saying. Now, of course, 
if it's going up plus one plus two plus three plus four huge point swings okay yeah obviously you got to listen but when when you're looking at the engine and there's only like a 0 0.1 0 0.05 0 0.3 difference it doesn't really matter okay it doesn't matter because we're not preparing for stockfish we're preparing to play against other people right and at the end of the day engines don't really know what to do with an opening like the hippo because the hippo is very closed at the start and at the start it's not super tactical okay so computers have a hard time knowing what to do with it what I found is that it will tell me inaccuracy, inaccuracy, mistake. And then all of a sudden it goes, oh, actually, I kind of like your position, right? So that's what happens a lot. Even though the computer doesn't mind this, we got to play H6 from a practical standpoint. And because the bishops are the heart of the hippo. Okay, you got to stop that bishop from going in there if this kind of thing happens. You see a battery ram, boom, play H6. Why does this work? Well, because now if white plays bishop takes H6, we take back with the bishop and it's defended by the rook. This is huge. Castle and kingside. Okay, we think hit our second one. A4, let's play A6, right? Whole idea being if A5, we play B5 and uh, and things are still locked up. And this pawn's really just going to become a big old target. And if Rook AD1, we tuck our knight. We have just finished the hippopotamus defense setup. And and there's, again, there's, there's certain lines and variations that we can't get this full setup in. But most of the time, you're going to be able to get this, okay? And if you can't, oftentimes it means there's something better available. Um, or you get kind of a pseudo or a semi hippo, right? You get a hippo on one side and then on the other side of the board, you kind of take a different approach. But, you know, these are things that I cover in my hippopotamus defense course. Okay. So I, you know, I really try to give you a holistic view of the hippo and not just the lines that we like playing against the most. White should not play against the hippo, in my opinion, with a two pawn center. Okay. But what does white usually do most of the time? A two pawn center. And in some sense, it makes, it makes sense. I mean, if someone's playing you, right? I mean, okay, they develop a knight. They throw the knights out. They're, they're doing what they're supposed to do, but then we kind of fast forward here. We keep developing, and all of a sudden, white's kind of in the spot where they can't break anything open, okay? If they play d5, we're playing e5, followed by f5 with kind of an improved king's Indian attack slash king's Indian defense, really, from the black side idea. Um, if we see e5 here, the computer there actually likes us taking and then taking advantage of a score like f5, which the pawn just left behind, um, and, uh, and the engine gives the advantage to black there after E5. Um, but in a lot of positions too, you can play D5. I've just found that against D5, we almost always lock it up and against E5, um, you know, we, uh, we oftentimes don't lock it up, but sometimes we'll play a move like knight F5. We'll take, we'll look at this bishop getting active. There's reasons for this. Okay. And I've made a bunch of other videos. Um, and I've covered this, this kind of stuff. Okay. This video is just an introductory thing. I'm not, you know, trying to explain every single little thing to you, but I'm trying to give you kind of, you know, what is this about? And then at the end of this, why would someone play this from a psychological point of view and from a personal approach? So that's the start. If you play a five B five, we close it up. That pawn's just a big old target. If you play H four and H five G five, boom, we're fine. We're good. Right. So white here, you know, they, they could keep going. They could even put the rooks in the center, but what are they looking at? Chances are that things, things could get very locked up in the center and, and all of a sudden white's pieces are kind of just stuck doing a whole bunch of nothing. Okay. Now for black though, there are a lot of ideas in the hippo and in my hippo d defense course, I cover the four main middle game attacking ideas. One of them is, is pushing either of these pawns and tucking the knight behind. Now, again, not all of these are going to work in every scenario, right? Like in this case, you know, G5, there's a reason why in this position it's not the best. It's because white could play H4 and start going after it. B5 is just not going to work because of the pawn taking. But in a lot of positions, G5 and B5 followed by tucking this knight behind is a good idea. We could also see moves in certain positions like F5 or C5. Uh, and finally, the central pawns with E5 or D5. That's the third idea. The most rare, though. And uh, and then I cover these knight moves. Moves like knight F6 or knight C6. Okay. I would say in this kind of position... Um, I kind of like a move like knight f6, okay, attacking that pawn. Um, notice that there's a bishop stack here, so the rook can't see it. We have two attackers. White has one defender. What white should do is defend this pawn. What could we do from there? Well, we could go after this dark squared bishop on e3. But what does white often do, right? What does white often do in a position like this? They'll push, okay? Now, we have options such as going to e4 or even rerouting to d5. If you want to take on d6, that's fine. We're going to take back. If you take here, we're going to take back again. Let's say you play really aggressively, quote unquote, and you try to kick our knight around. All right, we take the bishop. We castle here. Black here with a very solid position. Stockfish likes what we're doing. And um, yeah, black with a solid game. Okay. 
but the hippo, right? The hippo. We're not trying to win the game right away. And that's why it's middle game focused. Okay. We're just trying to get our setup and go from there. Now, what's cool about an opening like this is the more you study it, I mean, I guess you could say this about any opening, but the more you study it, the more of an expert you're going to become in it. And your opponent probably isn't going to know how to approach these kinds of positions. Okay. Some of my easiest wins in tournament chess have come from the hippo defense. Some of my biggest wins. In fact, my biggest win ever against a 25-13 international master, I played the hippo defense as white against my opponent. Okay. Now, you get these middle game positions, right? You study them, right? Let's say you invest in the course, right? Let's say you don't. Let's say you watch videos. Let's say you watch videos. Let's say you um, you reach these positions a ton. You you invest in a book. You you get coaches. You whatever you're doing, right? You're learning it. You play the position a thousand times, and every single time you plug the middle game into stockfish, into stockfish, into stockfish, and you start developing and growing in your skills. Someday it's going to be your thousandth game playing the hippo. Your opponent isn't even going to know what it is. Okay. And it doesn't matter how much prep they've done in their little E4, you know, Ponziani opening, Roy Lopez opening. It doesn't matter how much prep they've put into their English against E5. It doesn't matter how much prep they've put in into the Jovava London because we're not playing into any of that. We're not. We're playing the hippo. So all of their opening theory studies go out the door and all of your studies are very much present. Right. And that's a huge benefit. I mean, the reason I played the hippo, I'll be honest, I took about 10 years off. I played on and off for 10 years, but most of my time was spent playing basketball because I'm seven one and I, you know, I play basketball, whatever I finished college. Then I came back to it, uh, playing competitive, competitively in tournaments more. What I found is that these kids, these kids, these 10 year olds are something else. Okay. I, you know, when we were kids, when I was a kid, kids were pretty good for their rating. Now it's just not even fair. It's not even fair. Okay. If you see, if you see a kid with a rating, just add at least 300 points, okay? If the kid's 1,000, just, just act like he's 1,300 strength, right? Because in the last two months, he's gained 300 points, and he's he's winning every game he plays, and, and you're next, okay? So, you know, if you play an old, you know, no offense, but an old person that's like 85, and their rating is, you know, 1,600, they're, they're a 1,600, right? Most of the time. But if you play a kid, they're still on the way up. They haven't hit that peak yet, right? So... All that to say, right? There's my little tangent I'm playing against kids. But um, all that to say, uh, a lot of these kids, a lot of these adults had me openings memorized, right? If I play the Sicilian, they've studied that for hundreds, if not thousands of hours. If I play the Pierce defense, if I play the French, if I play E5, there, there's there's so much study that goes into openings like these. Maybe not the Pierce so much, but, but there's openings that White studies for a ton. The Hippo is just not one of them. It's just not. Okay, so that's one benefit that you gain, right? The advantage in preparation and the advantage in knowledge in the middle game, okay? And you also get an advantage on the clock because you're playing these moves very quickly and your opponent oftentimes just doesn't know what's going on. In fact, in my first game in the last tournament, I played the hippo as white and every move, my, my opponent was like laughing a little bit at a certain point, right? And, you know, the kid was 13 or so. I don't think he was trying to be rude. I think he was just like, what is this, right? But then we reached the middle game and I actually ended up winning a piece pretty quickly out of it. Okay, so why do you play the hippo, right? It's not to play timid defensive chess. It's not to try to get lucky, okay? It's not because of laziness. It's because you want the advantage in preparation. And if you're trying to improve in an opening like the hippo, what I recommend is every single hippo game you play, win, loss, or draw, play it, plug it into the computer, talk to your chess coach about it, um, by the way, I do give lessons, so if you're interested, I will leave a link down below to that as well, uh, private chess lessons, but no matter what you're doing, talk to your friends about it, plug it into Stockfish, game review it, all that kind of stuff. Make sure you learn something at the end of the day, every win, loss, or draw. And if you learn something every single game, eventually you're going to know a lot. A year later, you're not going to be the same hippo defense player. Uh, two years later, three years later, four years later, you're going to have so many wins, losses, and draws under your belt. And for every single game, you're going to know exactly why, and you're going to know exactly where you went wrong as well, and all of those results. And that's going to be a huge benefit to you and your rating and your improvement. Okay, if you're interested in learning more about the hippo, I made, again, as I've said, a ton of videos. Just go down to my playlist section. You'll see the hippo there. And, uh, and yeah, if you're interested in really you know, committing to the hippo, again, go to the course, plug in um, you know, uh, World Hippo Day, and you will get... 30% uh, off of that hippo defense course. 
let me know if you have any questions about the hippo um, as well as kind of the psychological approach to it. Um, I, I was just a big fan of it because, you know, I've been playing chess for a long time, but I didn't want to go back to studying opening theory all day, especially in over the board chess. I just wanted to get a position, learn it really well and go from there. Right. And here's the thing too, guys, you know, the hippo isn't one of those openings that you're going to master overnight. I'm just being honest. It's not okay. Now something like the England or the Stafford gambit, you can get success with that pretty quickly. Okay. And maybe the hippo too, depending on your level of play and your positional uh, prowess, but you know, something like the hippo, th there's going to be games where you get rolled. There's going to be games where you lose bad. I, I lost to a nine year old in Vegas. Um, after, I think I earned the CM title already with the hippo, but after that, I played a 1900 nine year old, which again, let's just add 300 points. The kid's probably 2200 now or something, but um, I lost and I got trampled pretty bad. Okay. He played a three pawn center against me, f4, e4, d4, and I lost pretty bad. Now, what did I do after that? I'm not going to lie. I took a few days off. Okay. Because afterwards, I mean, the kid, the kid and the other kids were like jumping around in a circle. I wish my opponent played the hippo, blah, blah, you know, and it was just, you know, it just didn't feel great when someone five feet shorter than you be too, but, but he did. Okay. And what I did when I came home is I said, okay, I gotta, I gotta face this. What do I do with F4, E4, D4? I studied it. I studied it every single time. Um, I saw it afterwards, except for one instance, I got a, a drawn position, you know, um, pretty easily. Right. And by drawn, I mean equal position. Okay. And that's good. Okay, if you can play as black and you know how to equalize without even thinking, that's that's the goal there um, in terms of opening theory. And the one time I did lose, right, I played against a Fide Master who played that and then castled Queen's side. I had a hard time with that setup as well. So what did I do after that? I went home, right? I went home, studied it, studied the lines. I, I mean, you know, I found out, okay, black's fine here, right? I, I just need to know what to do. I added that to my knowledge, right? I added that to my repertoire and I didn't see it again in a tournament, right? Uh, until I hit national master, I didn't, I didn't see it all the way up to that point. But, um, but if I ever see it again, I'll know, I'll know what to do, right? I'll have a better idea. So all that to say, let me know what you, you think down in the comment section below. And, um, yeah, I'm wishing y'all a great day. Hey guys, I hope you enjoyed today's video. I wanted to give a big shout out to my Patreon supporters for the month of February in 2024. Uh, you guys have been amazing. I'm, I'm extremely blessed to have you guys uh, as part of the Patreon family. There's exclusive benefits that you gain by becoming a member. Um, so, you know, I, I highly recommend that you check it out and consider it. It's been great to, you know, hang out and get to know the patrons uh, that have joined thus far. And I hope to see you there soon. Have a good day.